I feel honored to uh, be up here this afternoon uh, speaking to you all. Um, I flew into Charlotteville yesterday, had a wonderful drive down through the mountains, and Virginia is one of the most beautiful states that I've ever been in. Um, my sister lives up by Charlottesville. Uh, the Judys actually come from West Virginia, so I guess it's kind of like coming back home a little bit. Um, but we're going to talk today a little bit about what we've done and are doing and what's changed our lives in uh, Missouri. Um, you bet. Is that better? Can people, everybody hear me on the back row? Good. Um, what we're going to talk about is uh, basically using animals to heal the land. Uh, with input costs skyrocketing all across the United States, all of our input costs are going up. Folks, we have to figure out a way that we can actually improve the soil and ultimately improve the land in the forages that grow on the soil to stay in business. And it's not going to be uh, a free lunch out for everybody that has got their farms focused on fossil fuel. So we went the opposite direction. Uh, we're trying to do something different. Every nation in history that has destroyed its topsoil has ceased to exist. I think we need to wake up. Uh, you know, 90% of the irritable land in the world is now sterile because of our farming practices. It doesn't have any microbial life in it. Very few earthworms. <clears throat> and these are all the things that we're going to talk about today. This is a typical grazing operation in our, op you know, around us. You got the mud. Uh, you know, you got very little biological activity going there. The plants have been destroyed. The soil's been destroyed. This is, this is kind of common practice around us. You know, it's, it's not a real good way to get started. So we go in the opposite direction. We're going to focus on the plants and the soils and the animals. So we've got this mob of carbon sequesters, sequestering carbon, putting it into the soil. And those are our carbon dozers. Okay? That's the, those are our dozers. Folks, it doesn't do any good to grow the forage if you can't get it trampled on the ground. You're going to hear me talk a lot of today about building soil with litter. Well, what is litter? Litter is anything organic that grows up out of the ground with solar collectors, leaves, and the energy, the sun, and we can get it trampled on the ground with a ruminant animal. Okay? So we got this dozer. That's a pretty powerful dozer. And we're also going to talk a lot today about microbes. You know, we shouldn't call ourselves grass farmers. We need to look even further down. We need to call ourselves microbe farmers. So if we can take the microbes in the gut of the animal, which she has this huge fermentation tank, the gut, and we can use that to inoculate our soils and get the right density, stock and density, on the land, really magical things start to happen in the soil. You have this huge microbial explosion. Do you all realize that for every healthy teaspoon of good organic microbial soil, there's one billion microbes. Those are all little animals down there eating each other. It's a food fest down there. It's a war. It's a war. So we need to learn to use these animals at fairly high density. Now, you're going to hear the term stock and density and stock and rate. Well, what's the difference? There's a huge difference. Stock and rate is the amount of animals that you have on your farm. Stock and density is how many animals you have per acre. You know, how tight you have them at a certain stock and density for a period of time. So we, you know, we play around with all kinds of different stock and densities. Um, we do have a full-time intern now, and he's a very 
very eager, more than willing to do different things that I tell them. So here, we're actually uh, moving the cattle every hour. They were stocked at about 750,000 pounds per acre. But they're moved every hour. Um, I don't recommend anybody starting at this kind of stocking rate, or stocking density, okay? It's going to put too much stress on you and your animals. But I just want to show you some of the things that we're doing. So our operation today, we're microbe farmers. I got that at the top. We are grazing livestock. Remember, livestock are just a tool to harvest the green plants and convert it into a saleable, valuable protein. And we can heal the earth and the water cycle and provide a good food source for our consumers at the same time. Now, what's better than that? Folks should feel good about eating this kind of valuable protein. You're not destroying the environment. You're healing it. You're healing it. I'm going to show you some pictures today where we're healing it. So we're building topsoil, and we're also marketing solar energy. We're not using fossil fuel. Okay? So this is our previous grazing operation. We used to have the short stress roots. We didn't have any stockpile, and we fed hay, a lot of it, every winter. And we had bare soil. So what we were doing, folks, is we were concentrating on all of our farms. We've got uh, 10 farms. They're all within five miles of our house. Three of those farms that we now own, seven of them are leased. Um, so what we were doing was we were keeping all of our farms in a vegetative growing state. In other words, we were focusing on keeping our plants vegetative. You know, six to eight inches. Well, that's what we were taught to do. Keep that seed head from forming. Folks, the only purpose of a plant in its whole entire life is to reproduce. That's all it wants to do is reproduce. And if we chop that baby's head off in the spring when it's trying to get going, what's it going to do? It's going to send up a seed head because it feels stressed. Our plants don't send up as many seed heads anymore because we have a nice root system underneath them. So we were grazing these plants off short, so we had these little bitty roots under them coming into the summer heat period, the drought in July, and our grasses went dormant. They dried up, and we didn't have any winter feed for our animals. It always bothered me. We started out, I'll give you a quick background. I was almost bankrupt in 1999. Went through a terrible crisis, wiped out all my capital. I had to sell my cattle. Uh, I had to sell everything except for my farm. I was able to hold on to it, hold, barely hold on to it. And the one thing I saw, there was a sentence in there that your sole purpose in life should not be to own the land, but to control the land. And that one sentence changed my whole life. I started leasing land. I'm like, wait a minute. You don't have to own it. Well, what about all this land that nobody's doing anything with? And so we started leasing land. Well, I didn't have any money to put any cattle on it. So we got started on custom grazing, running his cattle, her cattle, and everybody else's cattle on our farms. And they were paying us $21 a month per cow. That's how we got out of the hole. Okay, But anyway, getting back to this short, this short grass thing, we had this annual hay feeding, lots of bare soil. So when the, summer, when the summer came along, our plants were in that vegetative state. We made one pass across our farms because we hadn't had any rain for four to six weeks. That doesn't happen in Virginia, does it? <laughs> That's what I thought. I was talking to a fellow, he said it was one of the worst that he'd seen in 30 years this last summer here in Virginia. Folks, I know right where you're at. I've, we went through the same thing. I have went through uh, six months with uh, four-tenths of an inch and 90 to 100 degree days with the wind blowing. That's brutal growing conditions. With our new method of grazing, we are not suffering droughts anymore. We still have them. 
but our farms are covered with the recovered sward of grass. When you can go into July and August, folks, and your pastures have this nice sward, it's an umbrella keeping the sun off your soil. That does several things for you. It, pre it preserves moisture. It also keeps the microbial and the earthworms working. See, an earthworm can't take sun. It can't take dry soil. It's going to survive. It's going to go down. And when they go down, all microbial action stops. It ceases. Your plants go dormant. Also, if your farm is covered with a nice sward of grass in a drought, you walk out there in the morning, you will be getting a little bit of dew on those leaves. So those plants are getting fed dew every morning. You can follow one of our plants down to the dry soil and look, and there's a little round area around the plant that's wet. You may not think that's much, but that plant really enjoys that little drink when you haven't had any rain for six or eight weeks. So that's all the benefits. So, what is the one thing that a cow needs to survive? It's located on the tips of the plant. Energy. Energy is the most limiting factor on our farms. Okay? Where's the energy located on the plant? Somebody said, I think tips. That's correct. Why is the energy located on the tips of the plant? It's because the tips of the plant are the closest to the sun. Watch your animals when you turn them into a fresh paddock. They'll go around that paddock harvesting that high energy tip first. A cow doesn't care about reproducing. She doesn't care about filling your milk tank. She doesn't care about raising meat on her back or fat or anything. All she cares about is breathing for the next day. And if she doesn't get enough energy from the plant, she can't do that. So energy is number one. Focus on getting as much energy through your animals, whether they're sheep, goats, or cows, or whatever, as possible. There's a mob harvesting energy. That's aster. That white flower is aster. My neighbors brush hog that. Well, we mob it. We don't mow it, we mob it. Those cattle, this is, in, I'll tell you how smart cows are. As we were moving those every hour across that aster, there was a lot of fescue and clover down underneath that aster. The cows were not eating that. All they were eating was the aster. And I'm like, what's going on? And Justin, our intern, was sharp enough, he went back to the truck on his own. I wasn't there. He went and got our bricks meter, the refractometer, which measures the sugar content in the leaves. And he started measuring the bricks underneath this aster, the fescue. He measured the bricks underneath this asteroid before the cows grazed it. The bricks was three. He went back three rotations because the cows were just tearing up the fescue three hours later back behind where they'd already grazed. He's like, what's going on? The bricks had went up to nine. Why did the bricks go up to nine? The sunlight. Once the cattle removed the aster, the feed behind the cows got better. And the cows went back and grazed it judiciously. Folks, we can out-stupefy a cow, but we can't outsmart them. <laughs> they have to be the best at what they do. Their life depends on it. Healthy land, healthy food, healthy animals. Healthy animals. If you don't know anything about livestock, that's fine, but remember this. A shiny hair coat is key. If a cow doesn't shed off, that's an animal that is not performing in its environment. Any animal that will shed off early like that will be your highest producing animals in your herd. They'll get fat quicker, they'll reproduce every year, no health problems. Those are the kind of animals you want in your herd. 
This is our carbon source. Folks, our cattle come into this mob of grass, and most people see that and they go, my gosh, you let that pasture get too tall. Well, don't tell our cows that, all right? Because they can go through there and they can harvest a lot of energy. See that, folks, the grass in the springtime, vegetative, doesn't have any energy in it. That's why it's dangerous to stand behind a cow in the springtime. Too much protein. Whoosh, comes right out the back. Okay, it's diarrhea. just shoots right out. That rumen in that cow is having trouble converting that grass to any carbohydrates. It's got too much protein. So if you let your plants get mature, the cattle can select a good diet. They can get the high energy plants, they can get a little lignin and cellulose, and they can also get some protein, which is in the bottom sections of the plant. Why is the protein higher in the bottom sections? It's the closest part of the plant to the root, the root system on the plant. So those cattle are coming in, and they're trampling about 30% of that on the ground. This is a hard one for people to get over. I, it was hard for me until I realized the importance of ground litter on our pastures. You're going to think of it as waste. It's not waste. Anything that's organic that you can trample on the ground is building you more soil. It's building you more soil. This is what happened when we started getting our density up and litter on the ground. This is a bottom that was pure fescue. A deer hunter owns this. We've got a 10-year lease on it. And I told him we could convert it into a wildlife haven with our management. And we have. But this clover came up. That's a sweet clover. It's over seven foot tall. It's amazing what's happening. This is what a litter bank looks like, trampled on the ground. Now, the cattle went in and ate about, on this paddock, about 50% of that. But they trampled the other 50% on the ground. Now, folks, if you leave your livestock in that paddock long enough, they're going to eat that. You've got to move them. Remember this, the higher the quality of litter that you can trample on the ground, the greater benefit you will see back from it in fertilizer. In other words, you're going to have a higher fertility rate with good litter than you will bad litter. Okay? So this is what we're doing now. Uh, two to three rotations per year. We're letting the plant get mature in the springtime before we graze it. Did you all realize if you graze off that plant early in the spring, you've reduced the capacity on your whole farm by 40%? 40%. That's huge. We used to do it. So we were stressing our plants in the spring, and they never, ever recovered the whole growing season, not even in the fall. So now we're grazing them once in the dormant season, once, in the, once or twice in the growing season. We were hitting them eight times a year. Those plants never had a chance to get recovered. And I can remember going out into our pastures and taking a spade and digging down underneath the roots on these short pastures. And all of our roots were growing horizontal, like this. Why were they doing that? We weren't letting them give it enough time to get developed. So all the roots started going like this. So what happens in a drought? If your roots aren't over four to six inches deep, you're dead. You're not going to grow any grass. Today, our plants you know, have roots 14, 16. The, the warm season grasses, you'll see some pictures of. It's unbelievable what they are. They're down there six, eight feet. Rule number one, increase your stock in density, not your stock in rate. In other words, don't go out here and buy a bunch more animals and put on your farm. Use the animals you have, just bunch them together and move them. Move them. Remember, overgrazing is not a term that's used with lots of animals. You can put a lot of animals in a small area, but move them. Overgrazing is a function of time, how long they were there. Okay? So what would we do? Well, we combined our herds. We had three herds. 
And Ian Mitchell was there in uh, 2007. He said, Greg, what you're doing here is not sustainable. He gave me one free day on my farm. It was like a heavyweight boxer hitting me in the gut. I'm like, what do you mean it's not sustainable? Well, he said, you're working 40 hours a week in town. You're moving three herds twice a day. He said, you're going to burn out or you're going to drop dead. He said, you've got to combine those herds. Well, I don't... I wasn't real good at that time at thinking outside the box, I guess. I thought, well, I've got to have three herds. My farms have got three and a half, four miles between them. If I put them all in one herd, I'm going to run out of grass on that farm. Then I've got to truck them to the next farm. He said, well, last time I checked, a cow had four legs. <laughs> and he says, put an ad in the Columbia Tribune, uh, grass-fed cook-off, music, and a trail ride and charge your boogers $250 a head to come out and help you move your cattle. <laughs> so we kind of, we, we combined our herds. Uh, we now have plants that are fully regrown. We have healthier plants. Folks, that one management decision of combining those cows, this is what it did for us. It decreased our workload by two-thirds. We have one mob, not three. It increased our recovery period by two-thirds. Now we don't have three separate herds eating at the same time at three different locations. And it increased our stock and density. Now we have a 300 horsepower motor instead of a 50 horsepower motor. Boom, we got a big mob. Okay. So now we're creating open savanna also with this mob. We're taking timbered areas. This was timber, brush, and we're parking the animals in the timber at night. We'll put 300 animals in the bush and surround it with polywire and just leave them in there overnight. So they're taking a fungal environment. That's what a timbered area is, is fungal. Lots of leaves, no grass. And they're emptying the rumen tank, the microbes from all the grass, into that timbered area. And at night, there's nothing much in there to eat. They do strip the leaves and they kill the smaller trees, but the larger ones get to survive. And now we have grass growing in our timber. Well, folks, we have 1,400 acres. 600 of it is grass. If we can convert some of our timber deers into open savannas just by using the mob, what's that worth? It's worth a lot. In Missouri, our land's three to 5,000 an acre. And if we can get some more grass growing in our timbered areas, what can that do to your farms out here? If you could get some grazing days off of that timbered area, where before maybe you're getting a log cutting every 20 years, what if we could get the cattle through there? And on a hot summer day, if I was a cow, I would a lot rather be grazing in an open savanna than I would out in a pasture. So it's just something to look at, I'm trying to throw out some new ideas. That's what happened. This is before the mob. That's what it looked like. That's one rotation. So they're in there for 12 hours. They went in and took all that understory out and busted it down. See, cows are big animals. You know, they're 1,000, 1,200 pounds, and they can rip and snort and stomp. And, I mean, they can really bust down some bush and uh, get the sunlight to the ground, inoculate it with that manure, and then leave it. Do that about twice a summer. So what's our farm inputs on Judy Farms? Well, we don't do any liming anymore. No fertilizer. We don't own a tractor. We don't own a mower. The only machine we own is an ATV and minimal labor. Major paradigm broken. Cattle can walk. Ian taught me that. Uh, it has been a major cost in labor savings, and it's improved our animal health from not having to haul them. This is what a cattle drive looks like. <laughs> that Sunday morning, while all you are sleeping in for church, we're on the road at about 7 o'clock Sunday morning. This is when I worked in town. I, ret or I quit my job in 2009, a full-time rancher. Boy, that's been nice. I can go out there on Monday morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, and we walk them down these roads. We don't call the highway patrol. We just walk them. Okay? We do block off the highway. This is a major highway. Um, <laughs> yeah, 
our neighbors uh, now pull out their lawn chairs. <laughs> and it is a big, it's a big event. It's a big event. We've been on the local TV station twice, showing our cattle drive. Uh, we have onlookers now. People have volunteered to help us. But we do block the road from both directions when we're on a highway. And we politely ask the people, you know, if you can just wait five minutes, we're going to be off the highway. And we haven't really had anybody get mad. The one thing I have done is when those cattle are off that highway, I go get in my old truck and I do run over the manure piles. A nice virgin manure pile this big around, hit by Mercedes Benz, that's not a good sight. <laughs> it will throw manure up on it. So just get out there with your truck and mash them. It doesn't take too long to do that. And in a few hours, it looks like mud, brown mud. Um, so it's been a huge fossil, save, fossil fuel savings for us. We need to brainstorm ideas to eliminate fossil fuel from our ranching folks. We need to work toward eliminating hay. Now, I realize you have to feed some hay. Uh, I think, and a rule of thumb that I give people is if you're feeding hay for four months, your first year, I would shoot for feeding hay three months and then two months. When you're comfortable with that, break it down to a month. Over the last four years, we've averaged eight days for the whole winter. Folks, we've got two foot of snow on the ground in Missouri right now. Um, it was eight below zero last night without any wind. Just, it's been raw and brutal for the last three weeks. Uh, we had to start feeding hay last Wednesday. We'll be uh, back on pasture uh, Sunday, grazing again, because we're going to get up to 50 degrees. If we can get that snow soft, the cattle will go through it. When it's frozen, they just can't push down through it. Our sheep can. It's unbelievable. A 130-pound sheep can outgraze a cow. They can. They got a foot. And they know how to use it. A sheep will dig down. I don't, you know, we're digging through snow this deep, and that little sheep will dig down there and expose a foot area and eat all that grass. And we've got 300 of them, 300 hair sheep, and you put them on five acres in about five days. Well, not that long. Three days, they've got the snow taken down like that. It's unbelievable. So, you know, Ian's been challenging us for years to have a flurd. Flurd, you all get that? Flock and a herd together? That's a flurd. And I said, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that because I'm not going to run two poly wires around all four sides of my paddocks for my cows every day. Or maybe every twice a day, if we move them twice a day. He said, Greg, don't worry about it. He said, just put one wire around here and throw the sheep out there with your cattle. I said, well, they won't stay in. He said, well, sell the guard dogs. And he said, the, the dumb ones will get picked off by the predators, and the smart ones will learn to stay with the cows. <laughs> I'm sure Ian's right, but I haven't done it yet. There's cows working for a living. Uh, that morning, it was about 37 below, wind chill. It was brutal. You couldn't hardly stand out there without your face freezing. But the cattle were grazing. The cattle were grazing. We do not provide our cattle any barns, or we don't have a barn on the farm. Well, we do have one. It's an old hay barn. It, we have a handling facility in it, but we don't have any shelter. But the cattle, see what kills cattle is wind and moisture. If you get a cow wet and then you throw wind in on top of that and if they can't get down in a drawer and some cedars, that's brutal. We don't do that. We make sure we have some cedar shelter banks for our cattle when it's cold. And it's amazing. You can go out there, you're freezing your tail off and those cows are just comfortable. They're comfortable. You know, they're, they're, they're out of the wind, their rumen's full, and they're doing well. Uh, a lot of people think that when snow hits the ground, that's a signal to feed hay. In other words, your cows can't survive. My question is, how did the cattle survive for centuries without hay? Livestock. There wasn't somebody out there unrolling a bale. The feed is good. We have fescue and all kinds of different grasses, but fescue is the best stockpile grass in the country that I know of. It stays green all winter long. The bottom sections of it. What time do I need to be done? Somebody look at their... I've, 
2, 2.30, okay. I don't want to go over my time. So that's another cattle drive. Uh, you notice we have poly wire along, that's beam field right there beside the road. That's not a hot wire, it's just a wire put up there. Our cows do think it's hot. Our neighbors all mow the yards, we got to fence that off. We don't want 300 cows going through their yard. That's not a good way to maintain neighbors, good neighbors. That's March strip grazing. When we're going in in the wintertime, we're moving across our stockpile. Um, we still have around 200 acres left at home of stockpile fescue that will carry us clear through to the spring. Uh, the cattle do better grazing than they do on hay. See, cows are herbivores. They are designed to eat grass from the ground. Just because it has a little snow on it doesn't mean they can't reach under that snow and get it. It's when it gets frozen or ice on it that can be an issue. That's the same paddock. 90 days later, it went from that to that. Uh, we didn't plant that clover, but sometime in its past history, that farm had some clover on it, evidently. Quite a bit of it. There's what a mature, high-energy plant sward looks like. It's not single species. There's a lot of different species in there. Remember this, folks. Hay fields always promote monocultures. You'd be surprised the number of farms that I go on to, and I'll say, now how many grazing acres do you have? Or how much open land do you have? And they'll say, well, we've got 200, but that 80 over there, that's my hay field. And it's always the best land. And I'm like, yeah, but we graze it, Greg. I said, that's not pasture. That's a hay field. Hay fields always promote single species. Grazing promotes diversity. When a, a cow reaches out with his tongue and wraps its tongue around the plant and pulls on it, it stresses the roots in the plant. It wakes up the microbes, and they get to work. When a sickle bar on a mowing machine goes over the plant and mows it off, there's no tugging action. So the plants will always grow back quicker to graze than they will mowed off. And with hay fields, you're not getting that treading action of the animal. Okay? I don't care if the cows don't eat it, but if you can bruise, remember this, if you can bruise every square inch on that paddock with a cow hoof, it's kinetic energy. It's kinetic energy. It does something to the soil, except the microbes. So if you've got hay fields on your farm, get rid of them. Put them in your grazing rotation. That's what's killing you. You don't have enough time before the plants are recovered, before you get back to where you started. That's because you've got that 80 acres out there for hay. Let's look at that a little bit. So there you have a large herd of cattle. This is a Ian's Ranch in Africa. There's 4,000 head in there. But they're only on 100 acres for one day. Um, riparian areas. Folks, <clears throat> I wish I'd taken a picture of this creek before we started. This is on one of our lease farms. It was continuously grazed for forever. Guy had 100 head of cattle on that farm, and he never moved them. They had continuous access to that creek all the time. And what had happened was every time it rained, that was all dirt, and it would fall off into the creek bed, and then the creek would dry up. No water. Zilch. There was no vegetation on the banks, and we've hit that with the mob now for four years, and what the mob has done is they busted down the banks. They're not straight up and down anymore. They've got an angle. They've reseeded them just by inoculating that soil with their hooves in the manure, and we take the cattle across the creek for one day. We take a section of that creek, and they go across it for one day, and they're moved. Folks, that water in that creek is coming from our grazing practices. We've got 80 acres of watershed on both sides of that creek now that has herbaceous, very diverse sward with deep root systems, lots of litter bank underneath it, catching every drop of rainwater in place and holding it 
the rainwater is slowly releasing down to the underwater aquifer and is feeding that creek. That creek flows 12 months out of the year. It has fish in it. It has frogs in it. And people say that cattle destroy streams. They do if they have full access to them 12 months out of the year. We're not talking about that here. We're talking about management. This is what livestock can do to our land. It's the only tool we have that can heal the land is livestock. Animal size. Form follows function. The function of an animal is to perform in the environment to which it is born. This is a beef animal, a Hereford in Mexico, old Mexico. It's a closed herd. 60 years it's been on that ranch. And it's been selected to perform in a very brutal environment, eight inches of rainfall. And it looks like there's grass there, folks, but everything in there's got a thorn on it. Those cattle are living on rocks. It's, it is. It's one of the most brutal areas I've ever been on. More bare soil. It's unbelievable. But this guy selected the animals. He's got them down to the right size. And those animals are performing wonderfully in that environment. Uh, here's the uh, wild herd of cattle in the Aleutian Islands. Those cattle were dropped off there in the 1800s. Mother Nature kills 25% of them every year to the harsh weather. They're living on moss, peat moss, whatever they can get. But they've adapted. The ones that didn't, weren't able to adapt are not growing there anymore. They're not living there. So those cattle are performing their environment. This is in Guni. That's a heritage breed in Africa. Uh, Ian's son's got about 500 of those cows now. Uh, they're a smaller framed animal. They're performing wonderfully in that environment. Those are elephant, desert elephants. We think about elephants as being riparian trees, you know, lush type environments. Well, here's some that adapted to the desert. Eating grass. Kind of neat. Multi-species. Multi-species allows us to harvest more energy over a wider area because we're using two different animals. Remember this. Every species that you can attract to your ranch supports eight additional ones. How cool is that? Think about that. I don't care if it's an earthworm, a centipede, a bobcat, or a turkey, or whatever. Whatever you can make a home for on your ranch is going to make your ranch stronger. Think of your ranch as a spider web. The more strands that you can have, in that web, the stronger it is. Birds, all this stuff. Uh, we're really getting into birds. Uh, we've put up 100 tree swallow houses this last summer. Tree swallows, number one prey is flies. They love flies on cows. So we've put up tree swallow houses. I'm not going to use pesticides. I'm not going to use all those worm, ear all that stuff. We just don't use any of that stuff. We're not going to poison the microbes in our soil. Folks, if you're putting any petroleum products on your cows, it's getting in their bloodstream, and it's coming out in the urine and the manure pad. You're killing the microbes in your soil. So we're into life. Remember that. We don't want to kill things. Let's, let's, let's mimic nature as much as we can. Uh, we were running the hogs with the sheep. Everybody said that would be a disaster because the hogs would eat the baby lambs. We haven't seen a hog yet that can catch a baby lamb. <laughs> they can really get with it. Um, that is the tree swallow homes. Uh, that is a really neat design. I'm not pushing that design, but if you want to build them, you can go get it on the internet, type in tree swallow house, and make sure you get the one that has the side door, just has a hinge on it. Super easy to clean out. And the hinge is just a nail. It's not a fancy hinge. And you can build those out of, we built ours out of cedar because that's what we have on the farm. It's just another thing that we can put out there that's going to help, help our farm be stronger. Do you all know what the number one income source is for the Desiree Ranch in Utah? The Desiree is the large ranch that's owned by the Mormon Church. It's like a million acres. 
The number one income source for the Desiree is not beef cattle. It's bird watching. Folks, birders have expendable income. <laughs> Why not tap into that? I mean, they don't take anything. You just They come out to the binoculars. You have some walking paths, you know. We're looking into it pretty strongly. We have a large bird group in Columbia. They like going out and looking at birds. It's kind of cool. Uh, these are our weed eaters. Uh, they're hair sheep. <clears throat> we don't shear them. Of course, you don't have to shear them. It sheds off. We don't dock their tails. We don't trim their hooves. We don't worm them. We don't vaccinate them. We don't wean them. We don't do anything. Uh, you do have to take the rams out when they're 16 weeks old. The baby rams, 16 weeks old, are sexually mature. And we do not use any winter lambing. We lamb on pasture in May. Folks, for those of you all in the beef business and you've got pretty good perimeter fence, I would look at adding some sheep. They are a tremendous market. They are the most efficient animal I think you can put on your farm. No hay through the winter, no grain, no nothing. If you get the right breed, don't get one from somebody that's been pampering them, but get some pretty good sheep that have raised them the way you want them raised. I'm telling you what, it's unbelievable what happens. They'll take care of the weeds. See, the sheep and the cattle eat different forages. The sheep go after the woodies, the woody stuff. Um, multiple rose bushes, thorn trees, uh, ragweed, all this stuff. We're turning it into lamb. We honor and respect our animals. Our animals have a wonderful life. They're moved to fresh forage every day. We love our animals. It's sustainable. We owe it to our animals to give them a good living. You are what you eat. If your animals eat junk, you're eating junk when you eat those animals. So remember that. Multiple solar-powered collectors. Folks, if you, look, if you were the sunlight and you're looking down on a, on a hay field that's just got grass in it and got these leaves sticking up straight up and down, and that sun's coming down, all you're harvesting is the leaves that are pointing up like this. What if you had a whole bunch of different shapes mixed in there amongst just the straight up and down leaves? You're harvesting solar energy, more of it. And that's what it's all about. The more solar energy we can harvest from our plants, the more meat, milk, fiber, whatever you've got for sale you're trying to raise on your farm, you're going to have more of it without having to go to the fertilizer company and buy them fertilizer to do it. Folks, when you're putting down chemical fertilizer on your farm, you're killing your farm's future. Ammonium nitrate, if you don't believe me it hurts earthworms, go out in your yard. If you're expecting a rain, go out there and put about 50 pounds per acre down. Just, just broadcast some out there. Then go out there and see how many dead earthworms you have after the next rain. It kills them. It kills soil life. And the fertilizer companies are laughing all the way to the bank. Because now you have sterile soil, and you've got to come back and use their fertilizer again. Ian's adamant about that. He thinks that we've been sold down a road of lies. We can't stay on the farm unless we use their fertilizer. It's hogwash. It's rubbish. Solar powered energy. Solar powered energy. That is a eastern gamma grass plant. We've got them coming up now, folks. We didn't plant them. These are coming up in cool season grass pastures, clumps. It took four years, but we saw them last year. Actually, we saw them three years ago. This year, they're getting thicker. We're starting to see more of them. What's so important about that? The more species of grasses you can have growing, they all have a certain growing window. And if it gets hot and dry, I promise you, those plants are not going to turn brown. Eastern gamma grass, a good friend of mine down um, up north of me, is the largest supplier of eastern gamma grass in the country. 
He's got a huge farm. That's all he raises. He took a backhoe and dug down beside some of his established six, seven-year-old plants. He went down 18 feet. 18 feet and still found root. That's unbelievable. Now, if a plant can send down a root that far, why is that so important? Well, first of all, it's going to stay growing, but what else is that plant doing? It's breaking up the soil. Good, good. What else is it doing? It's bringing up minerals. Exactly. It's transferring minerals that were out of reach to the cool season plants. The animals are consuming those leaves and depositing them on the top of the ground. So all the plants can get access to those minerals. It's going to help our livestock. This is where you want to get to, folks. This is April 15th. There's still stockpile that we have not grazed that was grown the previous fall. That's what those dead plants in you're seeing, the dry ones. There's green growing up through the dead. Why is that so important in the spring? Well, when the animals reach in to get a big bite of that green, those plants aren't recovered. They're not mature, but we're going to graze it. We're going to graze it knowing that we can't come back to that farm until it's fully regrown. But when they reach out with that tongue and get a, a leaf or a, a handful of those leaves, they're getting some dry matter with it. Converting that high-protein high grass into carbohydrates and some energy. So we don't have to put out a dry bale of hay anymore. On our spring grass, we've already got the dry hay mixed in with the grass. That's where you want to get to. You need to have some stockpile left. You need to have some stockpile left. Okay? We do try and strip graze 365 days of the year. Fresh recovered plants every day. I think that is the key to animal performance. Animal performance being getting as much quality forage to the animal every day as possible. When is a plant recovered? It's when it has four leaves. Isolate the plant. Look down the plant. And if you're really conservative, you want to make sure, you're not real sure, the fourth leaf, which it would be your bottom leaf, the one closest to the ground. Look at that leaf. Look out on the end of it. And if it's brown on the very tip, those roots are fully recovered. That plant is not going to put down any more carbohydrates in the roots and it's safe to graze that plant. Um, we were putting out a lot of these earth-moving tanks, earth-moving tires. They were free, and we'd put a big brass valve in and put the pad down, the, the concrete or rock, plumbing going into it. And I had one of these, I had several put in, and Ian, I was so proud of him. I brought Ian over, and he, I said, what do you think about that? And he said, well, that's a cute little tank. And he said, what are you going to do when you go to 400 head of cows? At that time, we had about 150. And I said, conventional, you know, thinking. I said, well, I'll just add another tire tank beside this one. He said, well, great, you got a great big tire up on the hill. Why don't you use it? I'm like, I like to fish. I'm not going to let my cattle in my pond. He said, well, don't let them in the pond. Just run a poly wire around it. So that's what we do now. We just run a poly wire around the edge of the ponds. We've taken down all of our high tensile wire that was keeping the cattle from the ponds. But they're only on that for one day. One section of that pond has cattle on it for one day. Then we move them to another section. They can stand on the bank and reach their head underneath the wire. It saved us probably ten dollars or $20,000. We have 42 ponds on our 10 farms. We also increased all that area around these ponds is getting grazed now instead of turning to brush because it was excluded from livestock. Our cattle, our landowners love it because now they can come and fish. They don't have to fight the brush. So kind of a neat deal. That's an indicator plant. That is one plant of eastern gamma grass. It's probably got 60 to 80 great big leaves coming up. It's almost as tall as I am. It will get seven foot. Um, 
gamma grass is called the, the uh, ice cream grass of grasses because it's so sweet. Cattle will graze it down to the bottom of the soil if you let them. So you've got to control your grazing on this plant, otherwise they will graze it out. There's another one. That's big blue stem. Big blue uh, was what grew on the prairies for centuries. It's a wonderful, wonderful plant. Wildlife love it. We didn't plant that. It's just showing up. The reason we never saw it for 20 years because we weren't grazing it correctly. We were coming around too quick. That little plant stuck its head up. It got its head bit off. So, dung beetles. Our dung beetle activity has exploded. Why has that happened? Well, dung beetles find their food source by smell. So, this is a pretty good mob I have here in front of me. Okay, I'm going to turn all y'all to cattle right now. Everyone is going to feel the urge of nature right now. <laughs> We've got a lot of manure pats out here all of a sudden. Okay? If that dung beetle's flying over, you're going to put off a pretty good food source. What if I take all y'all and put you on 100 acres and everyone just feels the call of nature there? You're spread out. That's not near the smell. So the dung beetles are honing in. They have these antennas, and they can, they can detect that food source. We don't use Ivamec. We don't worm our cattle. We don't worm our sheep. I feel like if you worm your animals, you're placing a crutch under them. There will be animals on your farm that won't be able to take it. Get rid of them. Sell them. Get rid of them. Just get them off your farm. Don't go worm your healthy cows because you have two wormy ones. The worm ones are going to have a dirty tail, a dirty behind, and they're going to be thin. They're not going to be doing well. Get them off of there. Don't destroy the natural immunity of your healthy cows by worming two bad ones. Get rid of them. We have dung beetle castles now. Check this out. The darn beetles are mining this soil out of that manure pat. There's a hole going down in the ground that looks like this. That hole is the diameter of a nickel. It's that big around, the size of a nickel. That particular hole, I stuck a, a dry weed down in it. It went about a foot and a half before I hit bottom. And there was probably tunnels going off on the sides. And at the bottom of each one of those little tunnels is a round piece of manure rolled into a ball with a larvae in it, an egg. Okay? Now let's think about that. What if you had about 10,000 of those across your pastures and you got a two-inch rain? Are you going to hold more water on your farm? Darn right. It's going to go kapunk. And it's got a nice little fertilizer batch sitting down in the bottom of it. And the earthworms use the dung beetle holes to traverse around your farm. It aerates your soil better. But here's, here's the big one. If you can take the, the, the moisture out of a cow pat within 48 hours, take your foot next time, on this, go out on the third day after the cattle have been removed off of a paddock, and go out there and take your foot and spread open a manure pat. And get down and look at it. You're going to be horrified. There's going to be about 8,000 maggots in there, little white worms crawling around. Those are all flies that are getting ready to attack your cattle. See, the adult dung beetles live on the manure slurpee. They do. The slurpee. They're sucking that stuff up. And they're drying out the manure pat. If they dry out the manure pat, the flies can't hatch. See, nature had this thing figured out. Ian says, we've boogered it up. I think he's right. So dry them out naturally. Goodbye, face fly. Goodbye, all those horn flies, all those nasty things. The ground litter, why is it so important? It's a microbial food. It is the interface between the soil and the litter. Okay? When you take a herbaceous plant, see, all you've got to do is take a plant stem and bust it over. 
but it's got to be a mature plant stem. A vegetative stem is going to pop back up. A mature one, all you're doing is you're breaking the sap flow from the stem or the leaf back to the root. And when you break that sap flow, now you have carbon. A lot of carbon. And all that carbon is going to be turned into earthworm castings. Um, for those of you all who don't know how many earthworms you have per square foot, this is a real easy thing you can do. Just measure off one square foot out on your pasture. Take a pair of uh, trimmers and trim off the grass on top and count the number of holes that are going down. That's going to give you a real good estimate of how many earthworms you have per square foot. We're at 17 right now. If we can get to 25, you have 1 million worms per acre. You also have 100 tons of earthworm castings per acre. Okay, anybody know what the pH is on earthworm casting? Seven. Isn't that convenient? Where is it being displaced at? right on top of the ground where the plant roots can use it. How many of y'all like to have a hundred ton of pH 7 highly active good stuff that the plants can take up really easy and not kill your microbes doing it? It's pretty neat stuff. It is our earth. The earthworms are our farm's future, folks. An earthworm needs three things. You got to give him three squares a day. You need to put it on top of the table where he can eat it. You need to keep the sun off of his back. And he also needs moisture. Earthworm runs out of food, moisture, or the sun hits him, he's not going to work for you. Here's the neat thing. We went out this year after Christmas. It was uh, December 28th. It was probably, I think that morning it was around zero degrees. We'd had lots of killing. Well, we had snow on the ground. We pulled the snow back, got down on the sward, the grass sward, still green, had green clover in it, and we pulled it open and looked down on the surface floor of the ground. There was brand new earthworm castings, brand new ones. There was spiders, all kinds of little spiders booking around on top of the ground of various sizes. There was amphids, little green amphids running around. Folks, there was still microbial activity. Life! Life, December 28th. If you can get that life working on your farm as many months of the year as possible, your farm's going to turn around quicker. But you've got to feed it. You've got to give it habitat. A lot of people look at that and they go, my God, that's nasty. Look at all those seed heads. First thing came to my mind is, my God, I'm going to have pink eye out the kazoo. Pink eye is a function of limited animal intake. You didn't give them enough energy. Doesn't, we, we're fine. It doesn't have anything to do with seed heads. Um, we do drive through the paddock on an ATV because our cattle will walk through that wire. In other words, when you turn them in and you just walk that wire through that grass, they're not going to see it. It's so tall, they'll walk right through it. So we use a four-wheeler to beat the grass down, and then that's what we leave. That's carbon, folks. That's a lot of good grass, but it's laid on the ground. The stem's been broken over. That's what it looks like. In four weeks, look at all, everything you see there is brand new forage. The dead stuff that that young man was holding in his hands is underneath all that. That's that dry stuff under there. And it's about this thick. Look at that. Look at all the new plants coming up through that. Folks, we're not putting down red clover seed anymore. It's all coming natural from the seed bank. Mother Nature's giving us all the seed we want from the mature plants. If you reach down that soil and feel it with your hands, the top surface... It's greasy feeling. It's greasy. There's life. There was one little guy booking across there. He had red antennas with uh, yellow hair on those red barbells. It was beautiful. He had about 
12, 13 legs on each side. He's booking across the ground. Oh, see, there's hard shell beetles down in there. There's everything down in there. Looks like Jurassic Park. <laughs> um, how many of y'all have seen Dr. Pat Richardson's video of soil life? Several hands are up. It's pretty amazing. She took highly microbial soil and she, she used a screen and gathered it in the bottom of a white five-gallon bucket and she put a movie camera on a 60X microscope and blew this stuff up to life size. Folks, it was scary. There was a predator sitting up there on top. They had a great big beak and there was a great big anaconda looking worm crawling along and the predator dove off on it and drove that spike right into that worm. And you can see him sucking the juice out of the worm. He won that fight. There was another predator up there on, the, on a ledge cleaning his mouth off with, with his little fingers. And there was wings sticking out of his mouth, still flapping. <laughs> All that stuff's happening down there. All of it. That's what good soil looks like. Folks, that first inch on there is solid earthworm castings. It's a new soil. We've grown three inches in four years. It should feel like vermiculite, you know, crumbly. When you pick it up in your hand, it should be loose enough that it's, it busts open. It's crumbly. It shouldn't have a sour smell to it at all. And the first inch is what we call soil cheese. When you break it apart, it should look like cheese. Every unit of that you can grow, every unit of humus that you can grow on your farm holds eight times its weight in water. Eight times. So if you go two months and you only get one inch of rain, you've held it all. And it's holding it until the plants need it. It's extremely important. There's soil on the left with a 20-year rest, soil on the right with 14 days recovery. There's our grazing uh, paddock where we put them up. I just go along and I throw them out like lawn darts. I have a reel on the back and my intern sticking them in behind us. <clears throat> False beliefs. Animals cannot fatten in large herds. Um, we're finishing grass-finished beef in our mob. As two to, they're 24 months up to 32. And we're finishing them off at about between 900 and 1,000 pounds. But those grass-fed bees get all they want to eat every day. Short grass means fat cattle. That's hogwash. We already talked about that. There's no energy in that short grass. Parasites demolish profits. In other words, if you don't worm them, you're not going to make any money. That's crazy. And we've got to feed them corn to get them to finish. Nope. Remember this. Animals are herbivores, not grainivores. Mother Nature's answer, there it is. That's eastern gamma grass. There's a solar-powered machine. Folks, when you can take an animal from birth and you can turn it into 950,000 pounds of good, safe, hormone-free, antibiotic-free, pesticide-free, chemical-free, healthy meat, You've got something to hang your hat on. We can feed the world without destroying it. How many of y'all drove across Kansas? Uh, the big feedlot area after. You can tell when you're getting to one before you see it. How would you like that in your backyard? Folks, if we could learn to be better grazers and get, I mean, it may be forced to this with the cost of fossil fuel. We may not have a choice. We may have to go back to grass. Wouldn't that be a shame? Uh, this is our interns. We like our intern program. We're trying to teach young people how to be better grazers. And then they have a future ahead of them. They can go out on their own. And uh, they have a bright future in front of them. The guy on the right, uh, Tyler, uh, he's working for Ian Mitchell Innes in South Africa now. I'd love to be in his shoes. Just for a month. He's having a blast over there. Uh, that is our website, <coughs> Green Pastures Farm. And uh, 
I just wanted to leave a little bit of time at the end. If anybody had any questions, I would answer a few questions uh, at the end here. And turn the lights back on. Something you want to turn the lights on. There we go. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, there's a bunch of them. Okay, yes. The answer was, how small can you scale this, what we've been talking about? Uh, you can do it with two animals. Just remember, whatever size farm that you have, if you can increase the density, don't let the plants get up, you're tramping them on the ground. Just make sure you have enough time built onto your farm that when you get back to where you started, the plants are recovered. Okay? If you get too many animals, I say for small farms, Personally, I would use sheep. They're a small animal. You can run more of them, and they're not going to eat as much, but yet you can still build soil with sheep. That would be the answer. There was another question. Yes? You say you uh, strip graze all year. How long do you keep them in a certain area? The question was, we strip graze all year, or how long do we keep them in a certain area? Folks, we're trying to graze 60, 30, 10. In other words, we're trying to graze 60% of the plant, 30% of it's being trampled, and 10% of it's left standing. Why do you want to leave 10% of the plants in the field standing? You have all these little mechanical levers around your pasture slowing the wind down. And also those little groups of grass give a great place for nesting birds to come in and raise several clutches before you get back there. Okay? But as far as time... You've got to look at it. You're trying to keep those cattle full. And I didn't get into that. My talk, no, I don't have animal performance. Um, anyway, on animal performance, you've got to look at the left side of the animal. If you're sitting on the animal like you're riding it, right here on the pin bone on the haunch, there's a triangle right below that bone. That's got to be full. If it's slunken in, you limited that animal. And, you, and always, when you open the gate and let your mob go through, or your, however many you have, get on the side where you can observe the left side of the animal as it walks through the gate. Okay? If that's sunken in, you're not giving those animals enough to eat. And if you continue to do that, they're not going to do very well for you. Yes? The question was, on a small farm, 40 acres, what would I recommend reseeding? Nothing. Nothing. I would go in there and get my density, start increasing my density. Let's say, what do you have there, thatch right now, just dead thatch? Okay, if you have dead thatch, I would go in there and trample as much as that thatch on the ground as I possibly could. If there's not enough feed there to feed your animals, that first year you may have to supplement. In other words, bring some hay in. Whatever you've got to do to keep that animal performing, what you're trying to do is get some density on that land Break that carbon down and get some microbes working for you. Okay? You got to get the microbes working. There was another, uh, you in the back, ma'am, and I'll get you. Do you have a breed of cattle that you like better than any other? Do I have a breed of cattle that I like better than any other? Um, well, that's a loaded question. Uh, there's, good, there's good in all breeds, okay? All I'm going to tell you is you look for an animal that is wide, has a great big gut short legs, and fine bones. If you get a big bone on a leg on an animal, that's not going to work on grass very well. Remember this, if you can stand and look underneath a cow, she's got a lot of air between her belly and the ground, that animal is not going to finish on grass very well. Okay? Uh, there was a question. Yes, sir. How do you find the pop rate can work in a dairy setting? How do you... How do we find that mob grazing works in a dairy environment? There's a lot of people starting to do it with dairy. Dairy farmers are really behind the gun right now. Um, I was in Wisconsin last year. I went across the whole state. And there's some people up in Wisconsin that are doing it and doing it well. They found out that grazing a more mature plant, you know, you've got to focus on the energy. Well, see, there's a time lapse here. The first year, you don't have any carbon on the land. When you get that carbon on the land, the second year is going to be a lot better because now you're going to have that carbon... Folks, the higher microbial activity you can get going in the soil, the
the higher the BRICS levels in your grasses go, sugars. That's what puts milk in the tank, okay? The dairymen in Wisconsin finding out that the more litter they get on the ground and a more mature plant has more energy, they don't have the excess protein anymore in the gut. And so their, their, their health problems on the dairy cows have drastically dropped. Now your milk production will go down some, I'll, the first year for sure. Yes, sir. The question was, when you're eating stockpile of fescue in the winter, you can eat it down to the ground. I don't. I used to. Folks, you're trying to leave something on that ground, whether it's in the December or whether it's in July. If you take that ground in the wintertime down to like this top that I'm standing on, and you get some rain in the early spring, how much of that rain are you going to capture? None. You don't have any carbon. Also, if you can leave some carbon on the ground, some litter, from your stockpile of fescue, if you can leave some on there, the earthworms have a feed fest in March and April. Yeah, so I'm, that, that much is enough. Yeah, if you leave, yeah, there's a growing point on a fescue plant. If you take that growing point off in the wintertime, in other words, you nub it down to nothing, that's going to cost you three weeks of early growth in the spring. Okay? Yes, sir. Do we back fence and stockpile? No. Uh, we're not worried about so much overgrazing in the winter. As long as you're moving your cattle every day to a fresh piece, they're not going to go back on what they were on yesterday because it's been fouled. Manured, stomped on, laid on, urinated on. They got fresh feed. They have no need to go back. Yes, sir. Do we have a problem with heat stress? Do we incorporate shade? Yes. Uh, we have, we're fortunate, we have uh, trees on most of our farms. We do have some paddocks that don't have any trees in them. Folks, when it gets up to 95 degrees, we're going to provide a shade tree. We'll make a lane if we have to back to timber to give them shade. I think it's extremely important. If cows get too hot, they're not going to perform very well. Yes, yes ma'am. Yes, can you run, run hogs and cattle together? Yes. You need to bond the hogs onto the cows. You got to do that in early springtime. I went out on our hogs and I would feed the hogs corn right in with the cow mob. Our cows don't eat grain. They don't know what it is. So I could feed them right in the cows. And the hogs learned that if they didn't follow me to move the mob, they didn't get fed. And that's how we bonded them on. Then we didn't have to feed them anything the rest of the summer. Because our hogs were tamworth. All they ate was red clover and cow pats and everything else. Whatever they could catch. Yes? When we combine the cow herd into three, how did we manage keeping the bulls out of them when we needed to? The breeding, is that a, basically your question? Um, what we're doing now is we're taking the bulls out April 1st and we're putting them in July 1st. We don't want winter calving. We're going to do something different this spring. We're going to turn in about 30 bulls into our cows. All the yearling bulls that are, we feel like are adequate bulls are going to get a chance to breed. And Ian turns in 400 bulls with his 4,000 cows. I'm like, why do you do that? Why don't you pick out the best? He said, I can't pick out the best. So he lets nature sort it out. The bulls that have the highest testosterone are the ones that get to breed. And we're, that's what we're going to do. Yes? Young heifers in that? Young heifers, our heifers are not breeding until they're two years of age. We're not separating the heifers from their mothers. Okay? We stopped that. Um, if you don't break that female to daughter relationship, they're not as apt to take a bull as a heifer. Also, our heifers are not being babied. They're having to compete with that cow. So they're not cycling until they're sexually mature. There was another question somewhere. Okay. Thank you all. My time's done.